that's actually kind of, kind of alarming because while it seems that a lot of countries are sort of skewing to the right, they are, I mean, there's nothing that seen about it, they are skewing to the right. Among younger voters, you find extreme right and some extreme left, the anarchists and, and pirate parties. But in other words, something far more fragmented even than that sort of troublesome skew. So, all to say, something dramatic is starting to go on here, and in ways, this, it's, it's amplified, it's supported by, sustained by some of these transformations in media. Um, if we think of the implications of social media, uh, the ways in which social media has been used, I mean, it's, you know, we've such good examples recently. David Cameron in, uh, in the UK has, has, you know, famously tried to be considered for a moment shutting down Twitter and Facebook because uh, they caused the riots. Okay, that's one way to see it. It was interesting that at that very, that very same moment, the police in Britain were trying to use social media, crowdsourcing, to identify people whose photos were captured by closed circuit television. Hmm, that's interesting. And in the very same moment, people were organizing themselves to clean up the streets, flash mobs with brooms. So uh, kind of an interesting set of very different deployments of, of uh, Facebook and Twitter. If we think of the, the Arab Spring, or even the Icelandic constitution, there's a new constitution in Iceland that was not yet passed by parliament, but it was constructed in, in part by using Facebook, and it was a way for the public to really react to different parts of it. So again, an interesting set of, um, a set of examples that point to the interesting implications, real world implications, of what is an increasingly uh, socially enabled set of, set of uh, connections. <clears throat> so, I would argue that, you know, the, the, the 20th century, one of the ways we might characterize the 20th century in, in some kind of historical hindsight in the future is a period where there was, you know, we talk about the Industrial Revolution, and we usually mean big heavy machines, we do mean that in industry, but the 20th century is kind of a heavy industry of media. The centralization of the press starts to occur in the late 19th century. The film medium consolidates relatively quickly, let's say by the, by the, by the mid-19-teens, although with the French there's already a global market in place by, uh, uh, before, the, before the First World War. The coming of the radio and recorded sound industries, again, consolidate the acoustical space, draw it together, and industrialize it. Uh, television, when it comes, does much the same thing. So our culture, and if you, and if you look at the, at the corresponding changes in our copyright laws, I mean, I can point to, to the U.S., for example, where copyright, when it begins in the 18th century, is a 14-year limit, and you can double, you can extend it one time, 28 years maximum, and that's in a period when it took, you know, 28 months to, to go from that's not quite true, but when it took a lot of time to go from one side of the country to another, but potentially months. So very slow transmission speeds, very short copyright terms. And if you think where this industrialized uh, uh, culture industry has been able to put us in terms of copyright, we're talking you know, in excess of 100 years right now, um, much more in excess. So, all to say, these industrialized media forms, these industrialized cultural forms, sucked much of the oxygen from the room during the period of their dominance. They are still dominant, of course, but we can see the fault lines, we can see the fissures, we can see the the instability in these industries. The recorded sound industry is a good example. There's been a lot of there's a lot of soul searching in that industry right now about what its future will be. Uh, the other media sectors are watching very carefully. There's been a rapid reorganization of media so that recording no longer stands alone, but is related to television and film and print as the as the corporations have, uh, have extended their reach. So I don't want to say that this age of, of the heavy industry of culture is over, but we're seeing some very interesting fragmentation. That's what I do want to say. And I want to say that we're at a moment of transition, potentially at a moment of transition. I don't want to sound apocalyptic, and what I may say in a few minutes will perhaps sound that way, because we need to appreciate the tremendous momentum that this industrial order has, has, uh, has that it, it has momentum. It, it's constructed a way, it's, it's given us a way of thinking, a way of ordering the world that isn't just going to disappear with wishful thinking or even new technologies. Um, it's in our 
economic framework, our capitalist economy, it's in our copyright laws, it's in our minds and our expectations. So what I'm gonna say rubs against us, it goes in a different direction. But why, you know, why things haven't magically transformed is because of the sheer weight of this industrial order. It's funny how quickly we forget that before the 20th century, most cultural forms, most mass cultural forms, were bottom up in construction. Things that, that we would call folk music, folk literature, even religion to some extent, things like even, even, even micro events like uh, quilting parties. These are all things that were participatory in nature. These are things that people did together. These are things without uh, uniform authorship or copyright. I mean, I guess there's some contestation over the, the right version of the Bible, but even that's a very collaborative uh, document produced over time by many different authors. So if we think about, about these cultural practices, um, actually you can see that for, for, for the history of humanity up until this industry occurs at the end of the 19th century, starting the 20th, we have done it ourselves. We have joined together collaboratively, collectively. Yes, there are authors. Of course, there's authorship. We know about Bach. Uh, writing his own music, and we know about Dickens writing his books. That's certainly the case. But by and large, the culture that most people had um, is a culture that came from that. And it's interesting to me that this kind of cultural practice, at least in English, we, we use the word folk in front of it. Uh, folk literature, folk music. Um, folk meaning the people's, uh, the people's music and the people's literature, not such a bad thing. But we've, we've resigned to the domain of anthropology. We look at it as a kind of curious pastime that people have, not in the domain of great art, by and large. And yet, with the kind of affordances I just talked about, with increased transmission speed, with, it, with you know, this ever doubling of, uh, of transistor capacity, with the kind of networking environment that we have, some very dramatic participatory acts, social acts, social cultural practices are beginning to appear. I don't know if any of you, some of you I'm sure know about this, the, the, the SETI uh, program. Uh, <coughs> this, this is a, a search for actually you know, intelligence in outer space. And to, to search for this, to try to decipher signals or whatever, takes a lot of computing capacity. This particular project joins up five million home computers around the world, uh, shackles that unused power into what is arguably the largest uh, the largest computation system that we have on Earth. Right now, uh, the fastest, the most powerful supercomputer we have is in Japan, the so-called K-computer. And it's just achieved eight teraflops of, uh, of uh, you know, processing power. SETI can do 770 ter teraflops. So it's dramatically bigger than the biggest thing that we have. And it's dramatically bigger and more powerful precisely because it's social. So here's a great example of an existing social participatory practice that, um, that you know, that works pretty seamlessly, we don't notice it, but is pretty remarkable for its, for its power. If we think of, um, I mean, the wonderful book, the wonderful work of Yochai Benkler, uh, at Harvard, The Wealth of Networks, tracks this argument out in great detail, but the relationship between economics and politics uh, especially when we think about changing models of ownership and creative commons or open source are great examples of this. Make interesting things happen. Firefox is a terrific browser. Um, Linux, uh, the little graph there shows, Linux is yellow, shows its share of the supercomputer market. I mean, it's over 90% share. Why? Because these kinds of operations put their energy into solving problems and making good ideas. They mutate very quickly. Unlike Microsoft and unlike Apple, these kinds of operations don't put their money into encryption, they put their money into progress. They don't put their money into lawyers and lawsuits, they put their money into making the product better and morphing it with the advantage of a lot of different people's contributions. So this is another sign of a kind of, of a cultural turn that runs against in some ways the, the logic of the centralized heavy industry of culture, even though you can see by the yellow graph that it's also opportunistically used by that culture. 
Another way that if you want to think about the, the, the social, uh, the, the kind of social enablement uh, and that, that, we've, that we've made use of, again, thanks to the infrastructural things I've just mentioned, things like um, tagging. Uh, Flickr, um, you know, you can say a lot of things about Flickr, but one of the really brilliant things about it is the fact that, that it, it makes good use of social tagging. I can give any, I can associate any attribute I want to a photo, and I can search for any attribute I want. And, you know, um, I mean, yesterday we heard about, I think, the great project, the, the, the virtual art database, but you can see that that database has, the, in a certain way, the dilemma that many contemporary archives have. Basically, except it's, it's, it's driven by expertise, it's selective, it's only about 500 artists, not about 5,000 that it could be about. It uses a selective list of metadata that lets people make that association. And that's fine. That leads to a very stable system. It's what most archives do. It makes good sense. But we can see with things like Flickr and, and you know, a bunch of other apps on, on, online that actually social tagging offers some, something quite different. It offers far greater nuance. Whatever people think something means is what it means to them. So let's, let's let them say that and let it let them find things that way. It's actually far more historically responsive. When interests change over time, social tagging also keeps up with that and changes. It's an unruly system, it's a chaotic system, but in the aggregate, it's an incredibly effective system. And, um, and, and I think it's, a, a, again, a culturally responsive system. And it does something else. It makes the people who tag things, and who, who it makes them participants in the community not just consumers of a product, not just people consulting a source of expertise, it makes them part of a community that's constructing them, constructing meaning. Um, there, some archives, the, the Dutch archive, uh, uh, the Image and Sound Archive, uh, built in Halal, has been doing some interesting experiments with tagging audiovisual uh, material in this way. So, uh, anyway, it's, it's on the move. So what we're seeing here so far are, are Algorithms plus network social media. And the combination is not only powerful, it's a potential game changer. Um, and you can see some examples here of stuff that I think raises very real questions about, about labor and about value. Um, live music, some of you might have seen, the mass animation pro uh, project, where animation was, was crowdsourced effectively, but it's kind of a Sony product in the end. It's really kind of interesting. How the, the it has the look of something that Pixar might have made. Not 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 to say that's anything wrong with that or it's evil, but it's kind of an interesting attempt to corral and direct the social. Uh, Innocentive, you know, lets people put out bids for great ideas and lets and lets you know members of the public crowdsource, hopefully for a little piece of the profits if there are. The Netflix tries to improve their algorithm 10%, their prediction algorithm, in a certain way. <laughs> you can see that it's a good or a bad thing, I guess. Depends whether you like prediction algorithms. Um, it's kind of an insidious thing, I would say. But, you know, crowdsourced that, that task, uh, gave a million dollar prize to the, to the AT&T team that, that won it. So these are examples that I think raise an ambivalence about this. And I would say the ambivalence, at least in, in my mind, is in two sectors. It's in, in the question of, um, of the, the nature of labor in a, in a still capitalist culture. Um, collaborative energy and collaborative work is great, but, the, you know, but on the other hand, it shouldn't turn a profit for someone else, one would, one would think. Um, and value, where does value come from? What are the values of belonging to a community versus producing something that makes a uh, profit? Anyway, I'll just say that these, these, like any tool, algorithms, combined with this kind of infrastructure I've just described, um, can be used for many reasons and by many agencies and for progressive or repressive means. But we're at the start of something whose implications we're just beginning to understand. <coughs> and, that's, and that's really, um, what I'd like to do is, is kind of step back. I'm a historian by training and um, just step back a little bit and think, well, okay, we've seen a bunch of detailed examples in our world, a lot of you probably use them even, so what's it mean? Why, is it so, why am I saying it's so dramatic? Uh, basically, I'd say this, that even though the algorithm is an ancient uh, discovery, we're still in the very early days of its actual deployment. 
It's robust.